to you. Please be seated. The book of Romans, chapter 12 tonight and beyond. Lord willing. Paul began the book of Romans, chapter 12, by speaking of the mercies of God that God has blessed us with. The mercies of God have been described for 11 gloriously long chapters. Chapters 1 through 11 of the book of Romans where God describes line after line after line of all that He has done for us in Christ, the salvation that He has provided for us. And then Paul speaks about the response that is a logical response of a human being to what God has done for us in saving us. And the first logical thing for a person to do that has been saved by so great a Savior and so great a salvation is that we would give our lives to God as a living sacrifice, holy which is acceptable to Him and our reasonable service, a full surrender of our lives to God for Him to use however He sees fit. And then the second response is, as we saw last week, is for my life now to be given to the service of the Lord. That the gift and the calling that He has upon each and every one of our lives as Christians, that we would give ourselves fully to that calling and that we would not hide any of the gifts that He has given to us, but that we would be found when the Lord returns using those gifts. And then in verse 9, where we pick up uh, this week, he begins to describe the third logical response, and that is a life of holiness, a life like Christ. And he declares in verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. And he's going to talk about in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, and 13, he's going to talk about what holiness looks like as it relates to um, our treatment of one another in the body of Christ. And then after that, he'll talk about how we are to interact in a holy way with the world. Someone might say, well, why would we need any exhortation on how to treat one another in the body of Christ? I mean, are we virtually flawless? No, the body of Christ is, can be one of the cruelest, most brutal places to spend time sometimes when we're not living the way that we should. And Paul declares, let our love for one another, our agape love, the love that comes from God, to be without hypocrisy, without acting, to be genuine. You see, when a person takes the earlier part of this chapter seriously and they surrender their lives fully to God for His purposes. And then they resist every single day the conforming processes of this world. And they go against the stream in this world. And then on top of that, they take seriously the fact that God has called them to do certain things with their life to be salt and light in this world. And when a person takes those commands seriously and lives them, they're not going to be loved by the world. So where are they going to find love? And they need to be loved and to be accepted. They need a place to come that isn't an extension of the battleground that is their daily portion in the world. Or that they would be treated the way that they are treated in the world, but that they would come and when they assemble together with other believers, that at least in that place they love me. And they're not phony about it. It's not an act. They really, really care about me there. And so we're to have a genuine care for one another, to know that when we assemble together as God's people, that they love me there without hypocrisy. And, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe when you came to know the Lord, 
Uh, I remember somebody saying, uh, uh, kind of off the cuff, they said, they said, I love the body of Christ. It's the people I have trouble with. <laughs> Evidently, you understand that also. But it's a wonderful thing to come to God. And one of the great things about growing older in the Lord is that breaking that occurs. And uh, you get your licks in the body of Christ and outside in the world and all these these kinds of things. And God really does have a way of reducing us to love. When Karen and I first came to know the Lord back in about 1980, there was a fellow by the name of Ernie and then his wife, Debbie Retino. And, and they, they did the, um, what were the kids' plays? The Salty. Yes, thank you. I have two wives here tonight. But anyway, I'm just kidding, just kidding. I know you need love, so forgive me for that. But he sang this song, and, he, and, the, and one of the lines in the song was, Jesus, reduce me to love. And the Lord is so faithful to do that in our lives. And so we're to let our love for one another be without hypocrisy. And then the second exhortation is to abhor what is evil. Now, I want you to notice that um, in that exhortation, there's the acknowledgement by God that there is Something in this world is called evil, and that we are to abhor it as Christians. We are to hate it as Christians. We are to hate evil. Someone has said, and so well said, that um, sin isn't bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. And that's another wonderful thing about growing older in the Lord and on. You watch the price that people pay to live in sin. And the price that people pay for the evil in this world. Sometimes not even their own. The evil of other people that then they're afflicted with in, in the consequences. That makes it very, very easy to abhor what is evil. So there is evil in this world. And one of the keys to holiness in a Christian's life is to abhor it. And the great question, of course, that it, it searches me, I assume it will search you also, is do I abhor evil? Do I hate it? Do I abhor the taking of innocent blood in a mother's womb in the United States of America? Or have I grown indifferent to it? that I can talk about that and eat a tuna fish sandwich and not even think twice about it? Is there an abhorrence of evil uh, for evil in my heart? That doesn't mean that I get on a rampage and I, and I go crazy and start harming people or I start to act differently than Christ. I love Jesus when he, he dealt with that woman that was um, caught in the very act of adultery in John chapter 8. And, and Jesus abhorred adultery and what, breaking down the family unit. You've got two families that are affected by, by what was happening between these two people. And they were caught in the very act of adultery brought by the religious leaders before Jesus. And then Jesus, as he dealt first with the religious leaders, but he also dealt with a woman. And when he finally asked her about her accusers and those kinds of things, and, and she said, he said, does no man accuse you? And, and she said, no man, Lord. And he said, neither do I, or does no man condemn you? He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And, and you know, you don't have to yell at people in that place. You don't have to scream at them when the Spirit of God is at work in their life. All you have to do is just say it from a holy life. And that will be the loudest thing in a human heart when they walk away from that. And, and where that evil is abhorred, it's stood against, but in a gentleness that looks like Christ. One of my favorite uh, Proverbs in, in all of uh, uh, the book of Proverbs is a gentle tongue breaks a bone. And when something is right in a situation and it's said in gentleness, it's as impossible to ignore as a broken bone. So you don't have to go crazy and, and, and not be like Christ and do wild things that people do sometimes in resisting sin. It can be resisted in a powerful way that looks, looks like Christ. Now, of course, you know, the great uh, mantra of today is what? Tolerance. So tolerance, it's tolerance, 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 and everybody's got to be tolerant of, of things. 
And the question that I like to ask of, of a person that's in, in, on the, you know, the, the tolerant uh, bandwagon, the, the unthinkingly so, we'll ask them, is there anything you consider to be evil? Is there any action or activity in life that is disgusting to you about your own heart or, or any activity on, on, the, on the face of the planet? And they'll say, well, of course, this and this. Ah, so you're intolerant too, aren't you? So let's get off the intolerant kick and the tolerant kick and let's really talk brass tacks, what this is all about. And what it's all about is right and wrong and evil and good. And let's talk about defining those things and where we get the definition. And so as children of God, a key to our um, holiness in our lives is to not get absorbed by the definitions of the world, that we abhor what is evil. And then to cling to uh, what is good. And so there's not just this kind of as we're looking at on the Sunday mornings where you put off, you know, what's bad, you get rid of the evil, you abhor what is evil, but that's going to create a vacuum in my life. A person comes to know the Lord and, and their whole life, maybe, or a significant portion of their life, has been given perhaps to evil. So now they come to know the Lord and they put those things off. It frees up remarkable time. Huge blocks of time. What am I going to give that time to now? to clinging to what is good, to having the Word of God now take its place in my life, begin to serve the Lord and do all of these different kinds of things. What is good by God's definition? And then, and then cling to those things. And then he said, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Now in verse 9 he talks about loving with agape love without hypocrisy. Here he's talking about phileo love with brotherly love. And that means that we're to love one another like family. And again, it's the same thing. The Christian, and I don't care where in the world, heard that whistle, unless it was me, but I don't care where a person is in the world, whether it's in a place where you can end up in a prison cell for sharing Christ or in the United States of America and anywhere in between, but when people really live like God has called us to live here in Romans chapter 12, people pay a price to live that way. And so there's again a need for them to have a family that they belong to and where they are loved as a family. Many people, the moment they come to know the Lord, their family disowns them. There are some religious systems in the world where they hold a funeral service for the person and that child is as if they never existed in that family, period. Now, we live in a country where there are so many churches and so many Christians. You folks are a dime a dozen. Just kidding. But, I mean, you've got all, that we're, so, we're so fat and sassy spiritually. And, and there's so many of us, and praise the Lord for that. If, if you ever travel abroad in other places where there isn't still that strong influence of the body of Christ that still exists in this country for all of its fault, and it makes this country different. But it, 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 and it's a wonderful thing. But there are a lot of people that, boom, they're cut off from their families. No fellowship with their families. And even if a relationship continues on a physical kind of level and all, that when we come to know the Lord, the things that are most important to us in life are not important to them. And so we become a part of another family where, where we understand one another because we understand higher things. And so we are to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. And so when we come together like this, and here we're coming to church and everything like this, and we realize, hey, you know, some of the men and women, and most of them perhaps, as they come into the church service tonight or they come to church, I mean, they've, they've really gone through it out in that world today. And they're living for the Lord. And, and, and they are. They're paying a price some of them are losing jobs and these things so they make a stand for the Lord on things. And, and, all, and then, then they come into this place and it's just like, okay, I'm, I'm, how can I serve them? 
How, how can I make this experience the best experience it can be? And, and, and to have that attitude towards the rest of the body of Christ. Let them back out of the parking spot. Just wave at them. And, and, and these guys giving preference um, to one another. They've got enough of a battle, all of us do, and battling against this fallen world. We, we don't need to be fighting with one another. And then he said, not lagging in diligence. And the word diligence, it literally means speed. And it has the idea of eagerness or the idea of earnestness. In other words, we're not to be lagging in, in passion, enthusiasm. There's not to be any lukewarmness in, in the body of Christ. You show me a lukewarm Christian, and I'll, I'll show you a lukewarm Christian. You show me a lukewarm Christian, and I'll show you a person who is wide open to being dominated by sin. If a person cannot be passionate about God and about the salvation that has been described in those 11 chapters, something is wrong with that person. Something is wrong with that Christian. And something else has come into that Christian's life and has stolen their heart away. The importance of their, their being passion and emotion, no lukewarmness, in, in, the, in the body of Christ. So for us, uh, Jesus, he, he spoke to that church at Laodicea, didn't he? And he spoke to them and he said, because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, he said, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And the word spew in the old, you know, King James and everything, and they, they just couldn't quite bring themselves, you know, 400 years ago to write vomit in the Bible. But that's what it means. The lukewarmness. And, and, you know, the kind of thing you can say, well, you know, I've heard about the church of Laodicea a hundred times, but let's let it hit us once again, like maybe for the first time, that lukewarmness makes God sick in my life. I had a guy one time come to me when we were over at the other church a few years back, and, and I'm, I might have been a little more demonstrably... Um, uh, passionate in the pulpit in those days and those kinds of things. But he, he walked by me at the back door as he was leaving and he said, have a nice heart attack. <laughs> I'll heart attack you, Buster. Get over here and I'll... I thought that's a perky thing to say. But honestly, if I... And I'm a type A and I know all that and, and, I, and it's no virtue, so I'm not defending it in any way. But I would rather be anything than lukewarm. And, and by the grace of God, I've never been luke, lukewarm in my walk with the Lord. I've been wrong a lot of times. <laughs> but never lukewarm in things. I can believe tonight that I'm saved, that I'm forgiven, that I've been freed from the things that dominated my life, and that one day I'm going to stand in heaven. There's no cause for lukewarmness. So the importance here, and it's a real key to holiness, isn't it, is that here, there would be that not lagging in diligence. And then he goes over the top and speaks about fervent in spirit. And so this means to be, you know, to boil, to be really on fire for the things of the Lord. You know, what's kind of sad is that when, when you get uh, that kind of way and you have that kind of enthusiasm for the body of Christ, if you're that kind of person, don't you ever change. You make the rest of us change. You just think, you know, and even in the body of Christ, you can think you're a crazy person. Say, I'm nuts. What am I? What do I care so much about this stuff? Why am I like this? And why, you know, the people get a, walk away from me and these kinds of things. Don't change that way. Stay boiling for the things of the Lord. Jesus, when he went in early in his ministry and late in his ministry, and he cleared that temple of the money changers. And then later on, the disciples realized the zeal of the Lord filled him, as the Scripture prophetically spoke of him. David shows up on that scene where here is a Saul, and Saul is with the whole armies of Israel and Goliath and the, Phil the Philistines are uh, 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 in the Philippines. They're all there, too. but the Philistines and and uh, uh, and Goliath there, and David and the children of Israel over here in a valley in between. 
And Goliath comes out all the time, every single day, and he puts down the children of Israel and he scorns them and he scorns their God. David, this little shepherd boy, walks up and he hears for the first time what they're hearing every day, the blasphemies of this giant against not only them as God's people, but against God. And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to speak this way about us and our God? And he heard and he was outraged by it. There was fire in his bones. Everybody else had fallen asleep. Nobody was looking at things in, in the light of a living God. And his brother came and said, you're just looking for trouble. Get out of here and that kind of a thing. He said, is there not a cause? What will be given to the person that stands up, you know, to Goliath? You know the rest of the story. Think of Elisha. Elijah, the prophet, all of the miracles, the boldness, the Mount Carmel, the, all of those things. And he's ready to be taken by a fiery chariot up into the glory of heaven. And he asks Elisha, I'm leaving. What do you want? And you'd think Elisha would say, listen, I don't want much. A nice condo in Maui. It'll do me fine. If, we can't, if that can't be arranged, just something close to Jerusalem. That's not what he said. Elisha looked Elijah right in the eye and said, I want a double portion of whatever's on you. I want twice what you got. <laughs> now, most of us would look at a man or a woman that God has used in the way that God had used Elijah and say, you know, I, I, I'd take half of what you got. But Elisha never lost his passion. And he said, you know what I want? I want twice what I see in you. You know the crazy thing is? God gave it to him. I gave it to him. I think about Paul at the end of his life. There is, he's wasting away in that Mamertine prison. And all seemingly wasting away. And when he writes that final letter, he said, listen, bring me a coat. It's cold here. And he said, bring me the books. Bring me the books, the parchments. That desire, though he would never perhaps be able to preach another sermon as a freed man ever again, that would fire in his bone to continue to grow in the things of the Lord. And it's a key to walking holy as God's people. So fervent in spirit and serving the Lord. You know, I think about... Um, you, you know, remember the old saying, I hope you've heard it, and it's an old saying for you. If it isn't, then everybody ought to hear it once or a thousand times in their life. The old saying, idle hands and idle minds are the devil's workshop. And they are. And they are. And when we come to know the Lord and the Lord begins to change things in our life, and again, I remember when Karen and I came to know the Lord back in 1980-ish, right in, in there, me in 1980, she was a little... Thicker spiritually. It took her a little while. Anyway, I don't want to go into all that. <laughs> but I remember I was working for the phone company and it was, just, it was just good, hard work every single day. wouldn't make a person rich, but it would take you more than care of, of you in life. And I remember coming to know the Lord and all of a sudden, everything began to change. Where money went, we weren't frivolous or anything before we came to know the Lord or anything like that. And I was working with guys that were working Saturdays and Sundays and 10-hour days and all these kinds of things to buy this thing and get this thing and all. And the funny thing is, we came to know the Lord, began to tithe as the Bible teaches and these things and put our kids in the Christian school and all this kind of stuff. And we never had more money than we had before. Just because God changes things. And so the importance of giving my life to what it is that God has called me to do as a Christian in serving Him and in giving myself to that. Because it will take away idle time and that's it, not good for any of us. I don't care who we are. At best, we will just fritter it away. At worst, we will delve into darkness depending on kind of a person we are on things. You know, sometimes I'll read, they have the statistics every so often about um, 
you know, the average amount that, uh, that a, of television that American watches on a daily basis, you know, and it's like almost seven hours or it's over seven hours, and this, this kind of thing per day per American watching television. That is an astonishing block of time, isn't it? And I think to myself, as I, as I, as I think about when, when Jesus spoke in, in that whole um, parable about watching and waiting for his return and serving, occupying until he comes while we're waiting for his return. And sometimes I, I, ask, I challenge myself actually with this and I ask myself, how much television can I watch on a daily basis and still hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and earn the joy of the Lord? And I would venture to guess I can't watch seven hours and hear that. Because if you multiply it out, the sheer amount, even if you're watching the Learning Channel or the History Channel, just the time that is lost. And so the importance, as he speaks here, of giving my life to the service of the Lord, it keeps us out of trouble. And we need to be kept out of trouble. Then he says, rejoicing in hope. And that hope is... The fact that the Lord is going to return. And so in all of this, there's to be that uh, joy over the fact, never losing sight of the fact that the Lord is coming back and uh, we're going to go to heaven and be with him. And that no matter how hard things get in this world, and, and sometimes things can get hard and all, we lose our joy and a loss of joy. Sometimes a person loses their joy. They start to drift back. Joy is a key to holiness. And and so there's always that source of joy in our life in in the hope, the confidence that one day we're going to be in heaven for all the hardship that may be a part of our life. On the other side of this, it all ends in heaven for us. And then he declares that we are to be patient in tribulation. That word tribulation is thalipsis, and it means a crushing difficulty. And it's used uh, some different places in the New Testament. But, but the picture is where they lay a man out on, on the ground. And as they lay that man out on the ground to kind of get a confession out of him, they would put a large board across his chest and then a gigantic stone on his chest so that when he would let the air out of his lungs, it was so much weight that he couldn't redraw air into his lungs. So it's kind of that crushing, suffocating kind of trial. And... and uh, and you live this kind of life, and, and there are trials like that. And, and God makes it clear that that can be our portion in life as Christians, this side of glory. But he tells us that in the middle of even those kinds of trials, that we are to be patient in that tribulation. We're never to allow it to cause us to quit. We're to continue on under that Never, ever are we to quit because of difficulty. Important, again, for holiness. And then we're to continue steadfastly in prayer. And prayer is an, another thing that's important for holiness. I, uh, Jesus, you know, in uh, Luke's Gospel, he gives kind of the equivalent of Matthew chapter 24 and chapter 25 where he talks about the signs of the last times and the end of the age. And, I mean, you read those and go, whoa. And then you pick up the newspaper, you turn on the news, and you go, whoa, here we are on, on things. And one of the things that can happen, especially for the generation that is going to be the one that sees the return of the Lord at the rapture of the church, and it if I was a betting man, I'd, I'd put the whole bundle on this one right now, you know. The things that we're seeing that mark the end of the age. And Jesus, when he was talking about those things, he gave the parable of the persistent widow who was, uh, the, as Jesus tells, there was a judge in the town and uh, this widow woman came to him every single day with her requests. And, and the judge said, listen, I'm no respecter of persons. I don't respect God. I don't respect people. But this woman is wearing me out. And in light of that, he moved to act upon her intercessions. And, of course, the teaching of it isn't that, that Jesus is like that judge and he has to be worn out through prayer. The teaching is, is if that can have that kind of an effect upon an evil judge who cares nothing about people or nothing about God, how much 
more readily will it have an, an impact upon a God who is eager to hear prayer and then to answer that prayer. And Jesus introduces that whole parable there. He, he says he gave this parable that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. And there's a relationship between prayer and not losing heart. And, and the, the famous saying related to prayer, prayer changes things. Yes, the first thing it changes is me. And it returns an eternal perspective to my life. It helps me to see the trials, to see the difficulty, and the larger context that helps me to hear God's voice. So the importance of prayer to holiness and faithfulness. And then he says distributing to the needs of the saints. Now in those days, and in really much of the world today, there is no, um, uh, there's no Social Security uh, there's no security net under people. Uh, their family is their security. And if key members of the family die or they are disowned because they've turned and become a Christian, disowned from the family, they are cut off from any security at all uh, financially in the world, materially for food and, and for clothing and these kinds of things. And so he, he tells us here that we're to distribute to the needs of the saints. The body of Christ, we're to look out for one another, the physical needs of one another's lives. And then he said, given to hospitality. They didn't have all these hotels that we have today and this kind of thing. So if you were traveling through a city as a believer, sometimes the only safe place that you could stay is if another believer came to you and said, you'll stay in our house today. And, and then... Um, opening up the hospitality and just an expression of love and holiness toward the body of Christ. And then he begins to describe uh, holiness as it relates to our interaction with the world. He said, bless those, verse 14, who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And the idea there isn't, in terms of, of cursing, it's not that you're swearing, but the idea is, is that when someone persecutes us, that we bless them and we don't try and call a curse on them. And, and so this is to be the response to those who persecute us. And when a person lives this kind of life again that's described here, there's going to be persecution against that life. You know, I, I am goofy enough in, in my own mind, I can lose sight of it. I mean, this, this may uh, disappoint you terribly. Uh, but it, I am goofy enough to think that if I live a life like Jesus, everyone will like me. Because I like Him. And I like everything about Him. And the, and the Lord just has to stop and say... Um, Reread all that, the red. Remember the red in the Bible? And reread all of that and see, even before the cross, even before the scourging, even before the last 48 hours of everything, the opposition, the persecution, all of those things that will be your portion also. And, and uh, you know, uh, so it is. And so we're to bless those who persecute us. Bless and do not curse and what God is saying here is we're not to come down to the level of other people and, and speak evil of them. And so when they persecute us, the best thing that we can say to them is, God bless you. They're persecuting you and all these kinds of things. You give them a big smile and say, God bless you, I'm praying for you. They, they won't know what to do with it. They won't know what to do. You return... Cursing for cursing. And they know how to play that game. And they know how to win that game. But they cannot win against what I consider to be the two most powerful things in all of the world. And that is the truth of God's Word and His love. There is no weapon that comes out ahead of those two things. And so this is how we're to respond to this kind of persecution. It makes them crazy. If it's any consolation to you when you respond in that way, God bless you, praying for you. Oh, argh! You know, in the words of Charlie Brown or whoever it is, Beethoven or 
Lucy or one of those guys. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. In other words, be appropriate to the situation. And more than that, it means to put the emotional condition of another person ahead of myself in a situation. So when I walk into a situation where it's weeping, I may be as as happy as can be, but I'm to make my emotions, I'm I'm going to put them by the side, so that their emotion is given the preeminence. I'm not going to disturb. And, and, and vice versa, joy with, with, the, with, the, um, uh, with, with the sorrow there. And so there's that uh, being appropriate for the situation. Be of the same mind toward one another. And the idea of that is to live in harmony with one another, to live in harmony with one another. You know, there's a, a kind of, of person that exists in life, and, but also exists within the body of Christ that just loves to argue over nothing. <laughs> they just love to fight. You see them show up at the home fellowship or you see them show up at the barbecue or you see them show up in whatever environment and you go, okay, I'm going to set my stopwatch because somewhere this whole thing ends in a fight over something, you know, the equivalent of how many angels can dance on the head of a, of a pin kind of thing. And, and the Lord says, listen, look at the things that we can agree on. Look at these things that we can be of the same mind toward and then give ourselves to those things. Now, if you had caught me 20 years earlier than now when I wasn't so old and worn out, I'd have loved to have argued with you. But now I'm too old and tired, so now I can obey, verse 16, and and be of the same mind to one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Don't Don't be a yuppie spiritually, upwardly mobile. You know, it was a... um, Many years back, at, when we were first starting out downtown, I, had, I don't know, the church was maybe uh, 100, 150, 200, somewhere right in that range. And I had a, a guy come up to me, and maybe you're here tonight. <laughs> and uh, um, so you'll realize people remember what you say. <laughs> I'm trying to learn that myself, believe me. But... He came up to me and said, you know, I love this church. But he said, um, I sell insurance in this town. And I've got to get among a different group of people than are coming to this church. And so he left and he headed to another church. It was a purely business transaction that, that he was making. So he, he's looking in the body of Christ and he's, when he, in, in, in looking for, okay, um, that's a person that can get me where I want to get and then that's a person that can get me where I want to get. And I think if, if I get a relationship with that person, then maybe I can get a connection over here and there's that whole kind of thing. Like Jesus warned when he spoke to the disciples and he said, now when you go out and you go into a house and someone invites you in, even if the house is humble and someone comes along later and invites you to stay in the mansion during your two months stay, there in that city, you stay in the first house you went into. You are not to be upwardly mobile in this way, spiritually speaking, in a carnal kind of way. The interesting thing is, is, as it relates to the body of Christ, is that we have something to learn from everyone in the body of Christ. And that's why James talks about not having any partiality. Oh, this person comes in. Oh, let's get you a chair right up here in front and everything. By the way, nice rings. <laughs> and then and that kind of thing. And then, you know, the ragamuffin gets put in the back row. But now everybody wants the back row, so we'd have to reverse. Oh, boy, we want to go there. But anyway, so the whole respect of persons kind of, kind of a deal. But in the body of Christ, we don't know anything, and in life in general, I don't know anything about anyone from looking at them outwardly or what they make per year or how they earn a living or what they drive. I don't care what the commercials say. And there is something to be learned from every member of the body of Christ. And so I'm not to have this... You know, kind of uh, ambition where I won't associate with the humble. I just, you know, want to get around the high things. He said, do not be wise in your own opinion. An exhortation to humility. Repay no one evil for evil. Oh. Is that, is that in your Bible too? I just want a quick show. Is that there? 
You ever read the Psalms in the Old Testament and David, you know, somebody did them wrong and David says, and just smash their teeth out. All right, you know. Where's that highlighter, honey? I found my life verse. That is Old Covenant kind, kind of thing. And so he says here, repay no one evil for evil. Now, it tells me that people are going to do evil against us. But that God never deals in evil. When someone does us evil, we cannot repay in evil because God does not use evil for His purposes. So if someone steals from me, I can't steal back. If someone slanders me, I can't slander back. That's repaying evil for evil. And it's something that God does not use. Instead, have regard for good things in the sight of men. In other words, what Paul is saying is make good your weapon of choice in those kind of situations. Someone does evil to you, he says, you go ahead and do good to them because people are watching. They're watching how you respond, and and they'll notice there's something different about your life. So we're not to go down to other people's level and responding to what they do to us. We take the high road. And if it is possible, and I love verse 18, if it is possible, that's a qualifying statement, as much as depends on you, that's a second qualifying statement, live peaceably with all men. And I, and I love those qualifiers. Because if I come to you and I say, listen now, you have to live at peace with every single person in this world and every relationship that you have in this world. Wait a second. In any relationship where you have two people, no one has complete control over that relationship. Not a marriage, not anything. Does one person have control over the health of that relationship? But what he's saying is, is that in any relationship, we are always to be an influence for peace in that relationship. We are never to be the uh, instigator of, of, uh, of uh, you, you know, fighting or a lack of peace in that relationship as much as depends on us. But there's the recognition that there are some people at certain times in their walk or their life or until they get saved or until they get broken that they are impossible to be at peace with. But it's all on their side. But as much as lies within us, we are uh, to look like Christ and living peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. And so God tells us that we're not to take revenge. Oh, a rough passage for some of us here. It tells us don't take revenge, but rather give place to wrath. Put wrath by the side. James said that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And it really doesn't. You ever, have you ever gotten in a situation? I, I know you haven't because you come here to church. And I'm just teasing if you're visiting. Have you ever gotten in a situation and gotten really angry and thought it was righteous anger? You walk away from that situation. God, I'm just looking out for your standard here in this world and everything like that. And as long as I'm here, I think things are going to be okay. And then the Lord begins to speak to you about the fact that, no, that was pretty much you back there. And uh, you've created an awful lot of work for me in everybody's life. There is a righteous anger, which we'll talk about next Sunday morning. But the anger that comes from my flesh... God says, you take that and put that aside. All that does is create trouble for me. It does not produce what I want it to produce in a situation. So he says, beloved, do not avenge yourself. Revenge is not for us to, to take on other people, but rather give place to wrath. For uh, it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So there's two reasons why I'm not to take vengeance against other people. Number one, it's reserved for God because only He knows all of the circumstances. He's the only one that knows enough to be able to address 
vengeance into a situation. So I am not to do it on that basis. The second reason I am not to avenge myself is he will avenge for me. And if I take vengeance for myself, then he sits down and stops doing what he is able to do very, very well. And so let him take vengeance in the situation. He's the only one that's equipped for it. He's the only one that can stay holy in doing it. And he will do it on our behalf. He knows how to protect his children. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. You'll you'll heap coals of fire on his head. Coals of fire sounds good. And tell me a little bit more about this uh, coals of fire on his head thing and how do we do that? Now, in the ancient times, you know, they didn't have uh, matches or or anything uh, like that. And uh, so if your fire went out in your fireplace or in in your house, uh, then you'd have to go to somebody else's house that had a fire going and take an ember, coals from that fire, and then take it back to your home and and restart your fire. And and so to take and to put a heap of coals of fire on a person's head, that way people carried their burden on their head, would be to put the coals there for them to restart their fire. They would take that, put that on their head, and they would head back to home. And everybody in the whole village would watch that creep that had been so lousy to you for weeks and for months and for years And when he found himself in a place of need, and it's interesting how God can force such people into a place of need to bring reconciliation in a situation where they needed to come to you for something. And then when we respond in goodness and they carry that back home, the whole village is watching. And the whole village is impacted by the fact that we have a different God in this world and that we are living a different kind of life. They will never be able to put it out of their minds. And it's more powerful sometimes than a thousand sermons as we respond in that kind of a way. And so God, Jesus is saying, in essence, trust me. You respond this way. You are giving me the most powerful thing in the world to work this situation for my purposes. And then verse 21, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Anytime I respond and repay evil for evil, then what I am confessing is that I've been overcome by evil. Evil has won. I've come down to the level of the other person in that situation. And again, so he tells us, don't be overcome by evil. Evil is overcome in in one way. It's overcome with good. With God living his goodness through our life and evil being repaid with good. You know, bullets are so much better. Or a smash in the mouth. Or to slander them the way that they've slandered you. And I mean, these can be kind of the first reaction, well, not bullets, but you know, the first reaction on, on some of, of these kinds of things. Just boom, right back like that. You think, I'll tell you, that'll show them a lesson. And you've got to put people like that in their place, in, the, in this kind of thing. And, 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 all, and the Lord comes along and says, there's nothing, as it relates to how I work in this world, there's nothing more powerful than that. It doesn't mean that you don't protect yourself from a crazy person or someone who's going to do physical harm to you or your family. But where someone is, is doing evil to you and speaking to you or treatment of you and these, and, 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 uh, you know, within the, the perimeters of, of you not having to protect your family or physical safety and these kind of things, then in, in, uh, in the, the most powerful thing is to respond with good. 
And so a beautiful call to holiness, but not just a call to holiness here in the passage, but that practical, needed, line upon line, precept upon precept, definition of what holiness will look like in the life of one who has surrendered their life to the Lord and and their living is a living sacrifice. They're resisting the conforming pressures of the world and they're serving God and what God has called them to do. Then this is what holiness will look like in our life, in our contact with the rest of the body of Christ and then in our contact with the world. Let's stand together. And if the worship team would come forward, that would be great. Lord, we've read all of these things in your word and a very, very remarkable list and defining of holiness and above all a a definition of Christ-likeness as he dealt with the unsaved world and dealt and deals with his people in the same way. And we ask, Lord, that you would take All of these verses, take them off of the printed page that's before us. We're glad for that. But we pray, Lord, that as as you write them on the fleshly tablets of our heart, that you bring these things forth from our life for your glory, Lord. And this is what we want people to see in our lives. We pray, Lord, for the men and women that stand around us in this room, In situations and circumstances that I know, Lord, where people have lost jobs, they've lost relationships, they've lost a lot of things to make a stand for you and to live for you. And Lord, we pray for your blessing upon their lives in this room tonight. We pray that this church and our lives as Christians, that and wherever we run into this kind of person, whatever the church in town or whatever the church in the world, that we would be that kind of an influence in in that assembling of your people, Lord. The world is, in some ways, even harder to deal with, except that we came from the world, Lord. So we know firsthand the blindness that's there, um, how cruel people can be toward Christians, um, how it takes that light to go on by your Holy Spirit to get them to see things, but you've got to have willing people for them to kind of be cruel to, Lord, for the light to go on even as we were in some of our lives towards believers before we came to know you. We just surrender our lives to you tonight to these definitions and ask that you work these things out of our lives, Lord, on a daily basis by your Holy Spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here tonight and you've never given your life to the Lord, you need to do that. What you have been a part of tonight is a time of watching God's people uh, talk together and enjoy one another's company before the service and You've watched us worship the Lord together, and you've watched us learn the Bible together and listen to the Bible yourself. The only reason um, you're in a church on a Sunday night in the United States of America is because God is calling you into a relationship with Him, and that's just the flat-out fact of the matter. So let's go ahead, and and for you, you can just cut right to the, the finish line and... Do what it is that God is calling you to do, and that is to surrender your life, to ask for his forgiveness tonight, and receive Jesus into your life tonight as your Lord and as your Savior. And there are going to be men and women up in front after the service. If you prefer greater privacy, there will be men and women in the prayer room at the far right-hand corner of the sanctuary. And they'd love to answer your questions uh, tonight and then pray with you to receive the Lord tonight and then give you a Bible and give you some literature to help you get started 
in your walk with the Lord. If you need prayer for anything tonight, these same men and women would love to pray with you and to pray for you. Joel, we close this.